everybody. Welcome to the Brain Talk webinar. Uh, Brain Talk webinar is an online platform where scientists, researchers, and early stage researchers have an opportunity to present their research work, which is related to machine learning and computational sciences. I'm Moin Ali Nakwi. It gives me a great pleasure to co-chair this webinar with Sajad Ahmadi from University of Oslo. Uh, this webinar is the first webinar uh, of the year 2023. Uh, today, we have some interesting presentation. Um, after each presentation, we have a question and answer session, and audiences can post their questions on YouTube live stream. Uh, the first presentation is given by Anders Hjort. Uh, a little introduction about Anders. So Anders uh, is an industrial PhD at the Statistics and Data Science Group at University of Oslo. The focus of his PhD work is to develop machine learning methods for the topic of house price prediction. The work is done in collaboration with the Norwegian financial technology company and some Verde, which is the leading provider of data about the Norwegian housing market. Anders has a master's degree in physics and mathematics from NTNU in Trondheim. Hello, Anders. Uh, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to your presentation. Hello. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks for uh, inviting me. I'll try to share slides. Do you see the slides now? Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you again for inviting me. So. I'm here to talk about um, interpretable house price prediction with machine learning. Um, and just some words about me, although you just uh, you just presented me, I'm a PhD candidate in statistics and data science at the University of Oslo. That's part of the Department of Mathematics. I'm supervised by, uh, I have two supervisors here at the University of Oslo, Johan and Ida, and one at NMBU, NMBU um, who this research is done in collaboration with all of them. So I'm primarily interested in tree-based supervised machine learning methods and how to make them both more precise, but also more uh, interpretable and easier to, to understand in, in many ways. And that's also going to be the topic of today. I'm specifically interested in uh, topics related to the housing market, and that's because I'm doing an industrial PhD in collaboration with Eindomsvadi, which is a financial technology company that delivers all sorts of uh, data about the housing market to interested uh, uh, organizations in, in Norway, like banks and insurance companies and so on. And at this point, I should just put in a, a brief disclaimer that sort of everything I present today is my research together with my supervisors and sort of my views. So I don't present random for this model or their opinions in any way. This is sort of independent research done by me. Um, with data from them. So I will, I will. This is the outline for today. Some motivation first, and then I will be a bit technical about trees and boosting. Hopefully, this will make sense to you after you have heard this, and then I will show you some results. So I don't really think I need to motivate uh, much why the housing market is important. I mean, it's, uh, but I'll do it anyways. It's a very big part of the economy. Uh, in, in Norway, we talk a lot about the value or the size of the oil fund, which is approximately 13,000 billion kroners, but the housing market is, is almost equally equally big. Um, and Norwegians have quite a high ownership rate. I think it's a bit higher than the EU average, at least. So more than 80% of Norwegians own their own home. And of course, most people have to take up a mortgage to finance this. So typically, people take up a mortgage of five times their, their annual salary, which is quite a big mortgage, uh, if you think about it. And uh, banks or financial institutions who borrow or give them money are typically uh, concerned with um, the fair value of the home they buy. Because if you take up a big mortgage and you don't pay it, then the bank will basically take your home. So the banks, therefore, are in need of what they call an automated valuation model, an AVM. And an AVM is a uh, banking language for saying a statistical model that estimates the price of a house given its features. And I will explain a bit more about this. So 
if we sort of move into more technical terms, the goal is to, sorry, <laughs> the goal is to predict uh, the price of a house given its features. And this is typically done by, we train a statistical model or a machine learning model on historical transactions. And of course, the most important information we have about a, a home is, or dwelling as we call it, is typically the location, the size in square meters. Obviously you pay more or people pay more for, uh, for a bigger house than a small house. The number of bedrooms and all sorts of characteristics like that, but also information about the area. Like, uh, is it many homes nearby? Is it many shops, schools, churches? All this information. So these are typically information you uh, train a machine learning model on in order to find the relationships that give a certain price. And it should be mentioned in this context that one should be uh, a bit careful when using these models. So Silo is an American company that provides AVMs for the US market. And uh, they are a very big company and very successful. And they had um, an AVM that estimated house prices in the US and they they were getting confident in this model, so confident that they wanted to, or started to buy homes that were undervalued according to their model. So if a home is on the market for let's say 1 million and your model says it should be worth 2 million, then it seems like a good idea to buy it and flip it, right? But as it says here, uh, the company had staked its future growth on its digital home flipping business because getting the algorithm right proved difficult. And another new story from the same, uh, from the same uh, story is here. Why did so many homeowners sell to Silo? Because it overpaid. So I don't know all the details of this story, and I should not so say that Silo had a bad algorithm. They probably have a much more sophisticated algorithm than what I will talk about today. But the, the point is, one should be a bit careful when sort of using these models, because there is a lot of information that we typically don't know about the homes. For instance, even if I know the location of a home, I don't know necessarily if you have a very luxurious or like how it looks on the inside if it's which color is the wall walls and all of this stuff so so yeah one should be a bit uh careful so uh but still they're of course useful so i hope i have managed to uh, give you a proper background now so i will move into the more technical aspects so here you see a decision tree and this is a uh, machine learning model. I'll explain you what it is. Probably many of you know it, but here you see some split points. Size less than 89, yes, no. Size less than 71, yes, no. Number of bedrooms less than two, yes, no. And at the bottom here, for instance, we see 3.5. Can you see this or is it too small? I hope you can see it. This means that um, if you give me basically a new test instance for me to predict, I will sort of send it down this tree and see in which leaf it lands, and that will be the corresponding prediction. So in this case, 3.5 means 3.5 million kroners. So I, of course, haven't made this tree. This is trained on a data set uh, to find sort of the best splits. And the result is, of course, that you, you divide the feature space into 11 distinct regions with one price or one prediction in each region. And of course, one decision tree is not so uh, sophisticated uh, and, and good. I mean, if I told you that every house had to sort of have one of these 11 prices, that, that's not very a very sophisticated model, right? But what you typically do is you train uh, many such trees. So there's, there's different ways of approaching this. One is random forest, who you maybe have heard of. Another one is gradient boosted trees, or sometimes referred to as gradient boosting machine, or <laughs> simply boosted trees. There, there's many names, but the idea is to to take a tree like I showed you, and instead of just using one tree, you train many in a sequence, perhaps thousands at a time, or in sequentially. And the trick is that each tree is trained to to or trained on the residuals, so the errors from the previous tree. So in a way you train, let's say 1,000 or 2,000 trees, each one correcting the previous one. And this 
uh, has turned out to be a very powerful um, method, not only for house price prediction, but for a lot of data science tasks. So some of these implementation like XGBoost or LightGBM sort of regularly wins a lot of Kaggle competitions and are used by data science professionals for a variety of tasks. Yeah, so, so again, the idea is to fit the model, a tree like I showed you, uh, calculate the residuals, fit a new model on the residuals, and that would possibly look different than the previous tree, and keep going like this. Um, but then some people uh, have uh, uh, sort of, uh, proposed using what they call tree stamps, which is a simple decision tree with only one split, as you can see here. So this is this tree is much smaller than the previous one, right? Size less than 89, yes, no. So this effectively divides the whole feature space into just two regions. This sounds even less sophisticated, perhaps. But the idea is that if you combine, again, thousands of trees like this, uh, you get much of the same effects. And the good news if we do it like this is that we get no interaction no interaction terms, which is good news because then we can write this in an additive manner. So an additive model is a model of the shape that you see here. So the, the prediction can be sort of decomposed into um, F1, a function of X1, the first feature, plus a function of the second feature, plus a function of the third feature, until uh, a, a function of the final feature, P feature. And why is this good news? Well, it's good news because then we can sort of visualize what some people call the shape plots or the partial effects of, of the first feature. So uh, here, for instance, the first, uh, I, I show you a shape plot of um, the first feature in my model, which is size, the size of a home in square meters. It should be obvious that, you know, the, the higher or the bigger the, the area, the higher the price. And that we can also see here. And why is this useful? Well, it sort of tells us very clearly the contribution from uh, from the size feature to the final price. So if, for instance, if the size is 100 square meters, we can easily sort of uh, read off the contribution that would have to the final prediction. And we can also uh, then uh, analyze what would happen if the size were 105 or 95 instead and so on. And this also makes it easy to make very uh, concise and clear uh, explanations of the predictions. So here is an example where my model predicted a value of 7.48, so almost 7.5 million kroners. And you may ask, well, how can we explain this prediction, which is of course important to many users. And uh, by using this, additive shape that I showed you, where each tree just it has a single split, then we can very easily uh, decompose the final prediction of 7.48 by looking at the feature values of, for each uh, feature. So here it seems that the location and the size was the most important, which is quite obvious. Uh, and so here, in this case, the size was 91 square meters, but then we can go back to this shape function and, and consider questions such as, okay, but how would the prediction change if the size was bigger or smaller? And so the good news, as I told you, was that we had no interactions. The bad news is also that we have no interactions. So uh, consider, for instance, um, many different city districts, like here. There, these are two city districts in Oslo, uh, where I show you the sale price versus the site. And they don't necessarily uh, sort of follow the same trend, right? But uh, with the previous model, I sort of enforce every part of the uh, data set, every city district, to follow this uh, shape function that I showed you. But what I want to argue is that this is not necessarily a good idea when you have a data set consisting of many different groups. And in this case, I use city districts as an example, but you can also think about, let's say, different 
social groups or demographic groups or patient groups in a medicine setting or, or things like that. So I asked sort of rhetorically her, should these two groups have the same shape function? And I think the answer should be no. And that's what I'm going to present to you how to work around this issue. So if you still follow, so far we have sort of three, or actually I've presented to you two options. We can train a, gen, um, a gradient boosted trees, so a sequence of trees with very deep trees, giving a complicated model with lots of interactions, but it's quite accurate. Uh, it's accurate, but hard to interpret. Or we can use this additive model, which is uh, interpretable, as I have tried to convince you, but less accurate. Of course, if you have sufficiently many data points in each subgroup, in each city district, for instance, then you can train local models. So you can train one model for a group A, one model for group B, and so on. But very often, you know, there's a problem that you have only so much data per group. So we include local models here, local generalized additive models. But we'll see later that this is not doing so well. So the idea that I am working on, um, and we'll show you something about here with my supervisors, is can we find sort of a compromise between the three of these? So can we train a sequence of trees where we allow deeper trees, not the tree stems that I showed you, but where we sort of only allow certain interactions? So the, the interactions, of course, come into play if you let if you have a deep tree that first split on x1, then on x2, then on x3, and so on, then that will be an interaction between x1, x2, x3. So we we sort of propose to use deeper trees, but to limit the interactions quite carefully. And by carefully, we mean we should only allow interactions that include what I called XCD here, which is city district. So if you first have made a split on, let's say, x1, then you can only keep splitting on x1 in your tree or splitting on the city district variable. <clears throat> the resulting model uh, will sort of have local effects, but in a way borrow strength between similar city districts, which is the idea that we think is a bit clever. Um, and this is especially powerful, of course, if you have few observations per group. Um, so I will show you some results. Um, I will show you some results from a data set of approximately 15,000 transactions from Oslo, the capital of Norway, from 2018. So one sort of row in this data set is um, one home that has been sold with a price and a lot of features. Uh, I think it's yeah, 14 different features, like size, uh, number of bedrooms, all of these things I mentioned. And here we see the 15 different city districts in Oslo. This map is a bit strange. I think actually the border, uh, I think the borders here go a bit into the ocean. So if you don't really recognize Oslo straight away, that's because some of these borders are way into the ocean. So <clears throat> the white uh, sort of uh, missing area is the city district that were, uh, without transactions, and that's the area around the royal cast. So if that helps you navigate. <clears throat> so as you can see, some city districts are more expensive or have higher values than others. So this is price per square meter, sort of density plots from each of the 15 city districts. And remember, we had four methods, or we I presented three potential methods, gradient boosted trees, the additive model, the local, or one model per city district, and then our method, which has uh, no clever name yet, so I just called it our method. And here we see mean root mean squared error over, I ran a bunch of different simulations with different training and test sets. So we want this value to be as low as possible, of course, low error. And then we run with different number of observations per city district in the training data. <clears throat> so what do we see here? We see that 
gradient boosted trees, which is the state of the art, of course, does it very well. It, it basically is the best model. This is not a surprise. The, the purple one, the generalized additive model, the one that is interpretable does uh, worse. And the local uh, additive models do quite bad when we have a few observations per group, but as we increase the number of observations per group, they get better and better, which makes sense. If you have 1 million observations per group to, to exaggerate, then you can, of course, train uh, models only for this local group. So our method, the blue one, does actually almost as good as the uh, gradient boosted trees, um, the state of the art, especially when number of observations is low. So we would not expect to beat gradient boosted trees because that's allowed to make any interaction uh, it can find, whereas our method can only make some interactions. Uh, so the key takeaway from this slide is that our method is not as good as the state of the art, but close, I would say. And I showed you some shape functions previously where I said that every city district had to sort of follow the same shape function. But with this method, we can make local shape functions for each city district. So here you can now read off on, I mean, this plot looks a bit chaotic since we show 15 plots in one, but the whole point is that these are 15 different city districts <clears throat> where we can sort of see local effects. So um, yeah, it's hard to see which city district is, is which, but let's say this blue one obviously has a, a quite a different shape when you increase size from 100 to 150 than what other uh, city districts would have had. Finally, um, we have also done some simulation, some tested this on some simulated data because that's what statisticians do. They always simulate data and test your models. I will not go very much into detail, but this is quite a, a normal simulation setup where we have 10 features, X1 to 10, but only five of them are actually being used in the data generating process. So X1, two, three, four, five, and the final five is just noise. And we modify this framework a bit to sort of allow for these groups, right? Because I want data sets where I have many groups with slightly different effects. So that's what we see here. We see basically this um, equation one, but with some slight perturbations in, in some of these uh, values. So that uh, basically blue, green, and red are different groups or different city districts, if you want. And we see basically the same results. Gradient boosted trees is state of the art. It's the best model. Uh, but our model is uh, almost as good, and we still get this interpretability effect. So I think I'm coming to an end. So to conclude, uh, gradient boosted trees or XG boost, if you want, uh, or if you want to use that specific implementation, is the state of the art in many machine learning problems, including house price prediction. Uh, but it's hard to interpret. So if you if you train the gradient boosted trees with only tree stumps, then you get a, an additive model, which is more interpretable, but then it's evidently not as good. So we propose a sort of hybrid where we where we allow only certain interactions and we show and claim that this is almost as good as state of the art while we still have this full interpretable models. And of course, this maybe I, I forgot to elaborate so much on, in, on why interpretability matters, but you can only imagine if if a bank uses this model to predict the value of uh, uh, your house, and then you ask the bank, well, why did you predict that? Then, of course, it's important to be able to interpret this in a nice way, which we can do with our model. So <clears throat> this sort of goes to show that these m models that are inherently interpretable can almost compete at least with many of these famous black box models like gradient boosted trees. If you sort of put a lot of effort into engineering and, and tuning based on domain knowledge. So I think it's quite uh, cool, both on the house price prediction case, but also I think it has potential for many other, many other areas where interpretability and accuracy is important. 
I think that was it. I'm thankful to my supervisors and to Anon's Study for giving me the data set. That was all I had and a bunch of references. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Anders. It was uh, quite an interesting uh, presentation, and uh, it's a really useful, I think, uh, topic um, because it it impacts like all our daily lives. I think uh, most people can can in one way or the or, or another like uh, relate to this uh, thing. Um, I have like few um, questions uh, specific to like uh, the data set that you have used. So uh, does it specifically focus on uh, uh, the uh, features related to the uh, buildings or to the area or does it also takes into con consideration like demand and, demand and supply or for example, how the market is doing or the interest rate, because you know sometimes that hugely affects the the overall price. Yeah, no, it's it's a good question, and uh, <clears throat> I have not used any of these macroeconomic factors here. So I have only sort of used a data set of uh, actual sales in Oslo in this case. And I guess the idea would be that if the interest rate goes up so that the prices go down, then that will be reflected in let's say tomorrow's transactions or maybe not tomorrow but you get the idea so then if you then retrain your model that will sort of capture the fact that the market is going down sort of through the data set so we don't sort of we don't take interest rates or demand or supply curves or anything like that into the model explicitly but i mean if you are a really uh, hardcore believer in uh, machine learning you will probably think that uh, this can be found somewhere in the data but uh, yeah. yeah, nice. Um, one more thing. Um, so um, the, the data set that you have, does it consider um, more than one sales of one specific uh, apartment, for example, uh, or comparison between them? Or is it more, um, does it consider it like two separate instances? That would be two different uh, roles in the data set, so to speak. So two different instances. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I did a specific data cleaning uh, regarding that because it's quite rare, I think, for someone to buy and sell an apartment within one year. But of mm -hmm. course it can happen. So it's maybe a, a thing to look more into, but I think it's quite a rare instance. So out of these 15,000 transactions, I would be very surprised if it was, I don't know, many repeated sales. Maybe a couple, maybe even hundred, but not much. Thanks. Um, like going towards the the models that you have used. So, are there like uh, some other uh, state of the art uh, models that you think can be used in in this uh, area? Yeah, I think. Uh... Some spatial uh, models, which is not my expertise, but I really want to learn more about because, you know, if you have the coordinates, then you can maybe uh, use some, I mean, spatial statistics is a field on its own, right? So how to basically fit the curves to, or yeah, fit to spatial data. And uh, um, I think that can be quite interesting, maybe even in combination with this kind of non-parametric tree-based models, uh, if you can sort of combine them somehow or first fit some kind of spatial spatial thing to estimate the price level or something, and then you can maybe fit uh, one of these tree-based models on top, or I don't know, but I believe the spatial thing is uh, quite interesting. Yeah, great. Um, one last thing. So, um, how do you see uh, your research uh, going forward in future? Like, what are some of the future things that you think um, can be done from where you are right now? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, one of the biggest problems, if I just go back to this tree, so the, the 
the reason why these trees are so popular or XG boost and random forest and all this is because it's sort of flexible. You can just fit it to any data and it works surprisingly well. But a big challenge is uncertainty quantification. So like the example where I told you a prediction was 7.5 or whatever it was, then how certain are we about that? That's quite hard to say, or it's at least not straightforward to, to quantify the uncertainty in these models. But let's say in a linear regression or in parametric models, you have all sorts of uncertainty quantification uh, mechanics already. But uncertainty quantification in this, these models is something I'm quite interested in and I think will be quite useful, both in house price stuff, but also in any application using tree-based model. mm. models. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you so yeah. much. Can I That's ask it a, from my side. Do you have any questions? Can I ask a simple question. Andersh, uh, have you considered effect of the time on the price? For example, we know that in Norway, some seasons uh, mm -hmm. is demanding mm -hmm. and affect the price. Have you seen, because, and this question also is posted in the chat room. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> um, well, I have used quite a small time frame here of just one year. So what I think what I did here was just to discretize into months. So basically 12 sort of time, uh, a discretized time window into 12 months. Um, so then, then the model can use this just as it uses size to split. You can say, okay, if month is less than nine or whatever, then go there, if not go there. But this is maybe not the best way to do it. Um, I mean, maybe you lose some information by saying that every sale within one month is in the same brackets. And yeah, maybe there are also some time series stuff you can do in addition, just like there's some potential with the spatial statistics. I'm sure some time series uh, methods on top of this or any, or something like that can, can be useful. Great. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation. And mm -hmm. Anders uh, took us to the housing prices and using neural network with housing prices mm -hmm. and economy related to that one. And uh, Jamil is going to take us uh, to the energy section and uh, application of the neural network for CO2 sequence sharing and CO2 storage, which is a hot topic in the field of energy nowadays. And uh, uh, a bit about the Jamil. Uh, Jamil Rahman holds a PhD in uh, geoscience from University of Oslo. Uh, he has a strong background uh, in oil and gas industry and also a strong research background in petrophysics, rock, rock physics, inversion, and uh, geomatics. Currently, he works as a researcher at University of Oslo. The title of his work is Artificial Neural Network Based uh, Caprock Structural Reliability Analysis for CO2 Injection Site, an example from North Entry. Uh, Jamil, welcome to Brain Talk webinar. The floor is yours. We are looking forward for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Sajjad. Uh, just give me a second. I should share. Okay. Yes. So thank you for your uh, introduction. So yeah, I'm working as a researcher at uh, Department of Geoscience UIO. And uh, as Sajja said, I graduated or I defended my PhD last year, June. So it's been a while. And uh, this uh, title is actually a paper which is published and open access. So this is the DOI, so which uh, I'll, I'll present today. And uh, as uh, well, this is a open uh, presentation and more general. So I actually pick a few terms from that, like CO2 injection. So I'll discuss a little bit about CO2 injection or CO2 sequestration or CCS. And then, uh, well, why we want to uh, characterize Caprock? So Caprock is impermeable layer. I'll show a little bit of that as well. So, well, why this is important and why we are choosing neural network to do that. So these three topics I'll, I'll go through one by one. So, yeah, first thing is like, well, 
but Sajjad say like this is a hot topic, uh, green shift and, and so on. So why we want to, or what is actually CCS? It's called CCS, carbon capture and storage, and storage in, in subsurface storage. So it's like geological storage of CO2. So this whole uh, value chain, if you see in this picture, uh, let me take the laser point. So it's, it's divided into three parts. One is called capture. So many industries you know, release CO2 into the atmosphere. So the concept is from that industry, they will capture the CO2 uh, directly from the industry. And they, then they will transport it somewhere. And then from there through pipeline, they will inject it. This is a model by Equinor. So this is uh, from next year, they will inject following the same model. So they will inject like 2.5 kilometer below the sea floor within a reservoir. So this whole system called CCS, but our focus is mainly this storage part. As a geoscientist, we are more focused on, you know, geological characterization thing. And capture and transport is actually not uh, our objective. So whatever I will, I'll, I'll show today, actually everything is focusing on this storage part of CCS. But if you hear CCS, it's actually combined all of those three, capture, transport, and, and storage. But why CO2? Why we want to get rid of CO2 or get rid of CO2 from atmosphere? So now it's the, the, you know, this time has come, like global warming. And uh, we all, all, all always uh, hear about it nowadays, like, well, uh, you know, our temperature is rising than uh, normal trend and blah, blah, blah. So CO2 is a major contributor to this global world. That's why we want to capture atmospheric CO2 and we want to inject subsurface and we want it there forever, something like that, so that we have less uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. And why this global warming is important, we also know this thing, like we already started experiencing drought, uh, you know, uh, polar ice melting, wildfire, or like cyclones, frequency increases or become stronger. Also, nowadays we have a prolonged flood than before. But, well, now we know we want why we want CO2 in get rid of CO2 from atmosphere. And we know the process as well, like we want to inject into subsurface. But is there any risk? Because subsurface is a confined space. And if we inject, is there any risk of that CO2 will coming up to the surface again or not? So that's we also have to think about. So let's see a, a scenario, like we have reservoir. Reservoir means that porous rock where we want to inject. So for our uh, example here, of what I said, uh, from 2024, Equinor will inject CO2, 2.6 or 2.7 kilometer below sea floor. So this reservoir is, let's say, located in 2.5 kilometer below. And you have a stress, you have pressure, you have temperature. And reservoir is a geological term. A reservoir is like this porous rock where you want to inject. And you need an impermeable layer which trap that CO2 there. So that impermeable layer, you know, this black color here, it's called cap rock. This is also a geological term, but cap rock is the impermeable layer which stops your CO2 to migrate upward because CO2 is low dense fluid. So if you inject it, it start you know, moving upward and you need a layer to stop that. So if you inject, you might have fracture, you know, of that cap rock or that impermeable layer, which we don't want. We want to keep that CO2 there for forever, like for thousand years, let's say. So that's, if there is a fracture, that CO2 might migrate upward up to the seafloor and into the atmosphere again. What is, uh, like, we want to get rid of it, but if it's come back to atmosphere again, that's like, you know, hinder our objective of injection. 
So we want to, we have to uh, characterize this cap rock or this impermeable layer, how much stress this cap rock can take. That's why we have to characterize the cap rock, the cap rock structural reliability. So how reliable our cap rock is or how much CO2 our cap rock can hold before fracture, because we want to store the CO2 there for thousands of years. So we simply, I just explained that cap rock reliability uh, using more Coulomb failure criteria. So this is a more Coulomb curve. And uh, you see X and Y axis is uh, normal stress versus shear stress. And uh, this cap rock, this line is called Coulomb line. This is the strength of that cap rock. And depends on your uh, axis, stress axis, sigma three and sigma one, you have this small circle. So this is like uh, our rock is much stronger than the stress now in this scenario, but there might be a scenario where our or more circle touches this uh, drop neck cap rock or that cap rock strength. If it touches, it means there might be you know a, a possi possibility of fracture. And in that case, uh, our CO2 might you know migrate upward, and which we don't want. And another another uh, thing is like you know this uh, if we want to uh, evaluate this cap rock strength we need this property sigma three sigma one and uh, poisons, uh, like uh, cap rock strength properties friction angle cohesion and we have very few codes from this cap rock and we have very limited number of samples sampling or like laboratory measurements but we know the geology uh, of that rock or depositional and, and diagenetic processes. And from there, we can actually find a distribution. Though like our number of lab samples are limited, but it's still because of we know the rock and uh, rock properties. So we can actually distribute and we can have our mean max from there. We can have average and a standard deviation. We can generate average and a standard deviation. And these are the parameters. If we have these parameters average and standard deviation, then we can we can uh, estimate how much this cap rock can hold. You know how much stress can hold. So this is a, a workflow stochastic model. So I don't want to go through it because this one is uh, another. Well, before using NN model, I published this one, but then. Well, this one is easily, you can estimate this uh, probability of failure for different cases. I also don't want to discuss about different cases here. And also the reliability index uh, indices here, these values. And also if you, you can compare with your deterministic factor of safety. So when we, we estimated that, then we thought, why not we use neural net to, you know, the machine learning to do it for us, you know, instead of doing it by conventional method, why not use machine learning? So we have our this data set, and then we jumped into machine learning, neural network. So uh, I, I just want to, yeah, uh, as I said earlier, we need uh, more data set for neural network, but we have very limited number of laboratory measurements for this properties. But good thing is we know the rock properties and we know the minimum and maximum values like we can define our minimum and maximum value based on based on the rock uh, geological uh, properties and when we can confine that we can generate using monte carlo like you know for our machine learning we define our minimum and maximum and we also uh, add our average and then we randomly generated uh, here, I think, at 1,000, 10,000, and then 100,000 and 100 million data set for different properties. So this is like, we are not away from our uh, range because from, from this cap rock properties, we know what could be the minimum and maximum value. And also from this limited uh, lab measurements, we can define the you know distribution and the mean, and then we can generate this. So 
then generate these properties for uh, use for AMN, uh, machine learning. So when we have this data set, then uh, we actually normalize this uh, for, for machine learning. So it's uh, scaling. So you, you see uh, this is the range and then we normalize it from six to minus six for all, the, all, all properties. And when we have this data set, then we use this model. Or well, this is the, the workflow, but we use this uh, neural net uh, three layers model. And uh, from this data points, we choose four different scenarios. One is like uh, data points uh, 1,000, and then 10,000, and then 50,000, and 100,000 data points. So this four data set and a three layer model. And our output would be fail or non-fail. Uh, that fail, fail or non-fail I discussed before, like if we inject, if our cap rock uh, hold that stress or not. So that's the output for, for this model, like fail or non-fail based on based on this data, data set. So we have this parties, we use Monte Carlo to generate data, but again, we confined our minimum and maximum and mean and then we generated the data set and then we, we train our model and and 75% uh, data we use for training and testing and finally 25% you know for for final results so this is a uh, verification uh, plot you see this classification score and uh, fitting time for train and test and uh, the number of uh, training samples, for example, uh, 1,000, 10,000, 50,000, and uh, 100,000. And uh, you see with uh, you know, increasing number of samples, our classification score increased, but at, at some point it's like just flattened out. Uh, I think up to yeah, 50,000 data set, then it's like same value. And uh, as expected, with the higher number of samples, we have uh, we need more time. So you see, in both cases, it's increasing. There is uh, another validation, a model validation plot, confusion matrix, and you see this. Uh, this is also for one thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand, and hundred thousand, and uh, we have a fairly good model but uh, again we have few numbers in 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 this uh, grayish zone as well so this is this might be the you know geology is really complicated and uncertain so this might be that but we have a fairly good model and we we ran our model and finally uh, this is a case study yeah, this is the results from 25% data set, which we didn't use for our, our uh, training purpose. So uh, it's like, yeah, 2,500, 12,500 and uh, 25,000. And you see our failure number and non-failure number and also the corresponding classification score. If we compare, so in our conventional method, our probability of failure number for, for this uh, model is really, really low. Compared to in uh, NN model, we actually have like failure more than 50%, which is kind of contradictory. But as I said, like uh, geoscience is really complicated. And this model, this probability of failure model, this is also a, a first approach in, in subsurface. So this probability of failure model is widely used in engineering geology, but not for subsurface, but that one is also introduced by us. So both models need to, you know, uh, modify or need more data or play with that to, you know, make it more usable. So in conclusion, I, I, I can say like, uh, well, this NN model though, like, what I said, uh, it's contradictory with our our uh, model we published before, but uh, we can say it's practical to use this math, math, math model, NN model, because it's it's really time, uh, 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 this conventional method is time consuming compared to this one. And uh, few other thing what I discussed, like uh, this, 
classification score is increased up to 50,000 data sets. And uh, we need more experimental data. And, and not only this NN model, we have to also uh, do some more analysis on, on our probabilistic failure model. Uh, my last slide is like this one. This is more interesting slides for me to, I just want to present this on the collaboration between researcher. So this paper is actually a combination of collaboration between uh, researcher with different background. And I, uh, in this platform, I want to emphasize that, like if we collaborate, like we each of like every researcher have, you know, a subject matter expert, it's called SMEs, but we need more collaboration to become uh, or produce more results, you know. So we are expert on our field, but when we collaborate, we can produce more than if you just only focus on yourself. So this work is one example of this collaboration and uh, I hope like in future, we'll collaborate more between different different background of research in UIO or like you know overall in Oslo. Yes, I think this is my last slide. Thank you, Jamil, for your great presentation. Uh, I would like I wrote some notes here when you're describing about your model and about the you science you in the geological aspects to just to. Uh, clarify more for our audiences that uh, uh, what your work have focused on. On slide 12, I think you showed the, some Gaussian distributions that you scaled your data. Uh, can you please tell me that what was the purpose of scaling your data? What was the advantage of this work? Uh, yes, thank you, Sajjad. Uh, this is a nice question. And, and well, so you see this, uh, each property have like different range. And this is uh, very difficult for in an or like if we just normalize all properties in same range or same scale, it's easy for model to train. So that's the main purpose to speed up the you know modeling process. Great. Great for speeding up your model, and also uh, in a slide that you were showing the workflow of your model. Uh, can you please? Uh, I think yeah. slide thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you use classification, uh, neural network for classification here. For sure, you will have one neuron at the end. Uh, can you please say how many layers had your model and how many neurons per each layer, if you can remember now? Uh, well, yeah, so far I remember like we have uh, we have three three layers model, uh, three layers uh, in a model, yeah. And uh, I think in the first layer we have 14 nodes and uh, i think second layer 10 nodes and and finally i think on third layer we have uh, one one node great yeah. time is running and i want to put emphasis on a very important part of your work that i think is very interesting and it was uh, producing the data you had you, we know that in science for example uh, sometimes we have lack of data and we want to use mm -hmm neural network and neural network is kind of data hungry they need more data for example astronomers uh, 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 want to take samples from mercury but how is long-term experiment or some experiments are very expensive or they are long term yeah. how we produce the data I, I saw in your presentation you produce synthetic data you use some yeah. lab data and to produce some synthetic data. And in one table, you were uh, discussing about uh, stresses, sigma one, sigma two, FOS. They are parameters, physical parameters that you get from experiment, that you mm -hmm. take some samples from Earth or layers of the Earth and then yeah. produce synthetic data. Can you please uh, develop this discussion and argue around it uh, and make it more clear for our audiences. Yeah, so so first thing is, uh, this is Caprock. Yeah, Caprock is what I said, it's impermeable layer. So 
this impermeable la layer doing this kind of laboratory experiment is really time consuming like for several months maybe you know take one sample to to run because of this impermeability of that that rocks and second thing is most of the time you know the oil companies they focus on on where this oil and gas is like porous rock so they normally acquire core which we need to run this lab data from that part and they normally ignore this upper cap rock or the impermeable layer because that is not their uh, interest their interest is where you know we have this hydrocarbon or now where we want to inject so that's why we have very limited number of cores or like rock sample from subsurface in that section and it takes long time to run laboratory experiment for for those uh, kind of rocks and that's why we have very limited number of uh, rock samples but good thing is uh, you know, from the physical properties of rock, we can easily identify the minimum and maximum values for each property. Uh, for example, this property list. So we we can we can identify this rock strength property mainly, you know, the cohesion and friction angle. From the physical property of that rock, we can identify minimum and maximum. We can get physically. So if we confine our, our uh, data generation model, you know, minimum and max, maximum, and we say like we, we don't want our data set to go exceed that limit, then we are good to you know, go with this uh, synthetic generated values because our rock should have database or data uh, properties within this range. And also though like few numbers of few data lab generated data but we have we can identify our mean as well and from our understanding about that rock we can also test this mean value makes sense or not okay thank you Jamie. And, uh, yeah uh, how we, we, we just confine three, then three minutes i have a, a, a one important question then can you remember can you remember conventionally the models that they were using because you compared that uh, you reported the time of the convergence of your model also uh, can you remember conventionally how long did it take to run uh, one model for predicting fail or not failure of the cap rock with conventional methods so if, i think partial differential equations something that conventionally used yeah well uh, it depends like how large our model is for numerical for numerical stimulation this is uh, really you know depends on how many grid cell we have mm -hmm. and how large our model is it, it takes several days to run a model mm -hmm. uh, i'm actually running one model now and uh, today is like fifth day still it's running and i don't know how long it will run so it depends on like how big you want to build your model for numerical simulation so numerical sim simulation takes long long time but compared to like it was in, faster you think and... yeah yeah definitely faster but again like well yeah it depends on the you know the train data sets and and, and how much confidence we have yeah yeah, yeah. we are mm -hmm. just uh, left with a couple of minutes two minutes and can you uh, uh, very briefly say talk about the future of your work and do you think neural network could be a future of the co2 storage uh, could be effective or not E, e, yes, so, uh, well, CCS, as you said, also, I, I emphasize on, like, CCS is uh, kind of, you know, the new, uh, you know, green shift or new technology we have to build in. And I think, yeah, in future, we have to, you know, use neural network to get quick result, but also we have to make sure, like, we... You see our data set, and we have uh, you know a quality output. Great. So if we can make sure that, then I would say like well, neural net or machine learning would be the future for for even uh, you know not only CCS also oil and gas industry as well. So actually, I am now converting all of my work what I did for you, conventional Jamie. way. 
Yeah, I just want to use now. We are machine gradually line. ending the webinar. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you, Andesh. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitations attending to this webinar. I hope our audiences also enjoy uh, from the topics that I tell. Thank you, Moin. And uh, uh, just I'm talking with our audiences that please subscribe to us, follow us. We have more interesting topics in this new year and uh, inform us about your comments and uh, uh, the technicalities of webinar. Do you like it or uh, the which part is more interesting for you and inform us and write your comments. We'll uh, reply to your comments. Thank you very much. I'm ending the session. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.